They go to university, they give them credit cards like they're candy. Like, you know, take this credit card, $1,000 each, right? You know, and they have like 20 credit cards. They just go, all the banks turn up, take a credit card. You know, they get you right in college, right? That the banks get you right the first day you walk in our frosh week, there's five tables sitting there. It's the big five, right? Back 20 years ago, you could get a part-time job or a full-time job during the summer. You save enough money, pay your tuition. Now with the high cost of tuition, you can't make enough money in the summer to do that. So you're having to supplement with your, with your credit cards or you're having to take on massive OSAP debts. People have become more accepting of the idea that it's okay to carry debt. It's become more societally acceptable. And because people are growing up in an environment where it appears to be okay to have debt, they're not as afraid of it. And when you're not as afraid of it, you're not as wary of what you're borrowing. Um, so when you're looking at a contract to sign for an installment loan from a payday loan company that's got a 49% interest rate on it, you're not scared to death of it, but you should be. At one time, payday loans were very taboo things. They popped up, they were things that people knew not to have. So when I meet with an older person, they generally say, yeah, I should never went to the payday loan places. I know I was wrong, I didn't have it. Where the younger generation I'm finding is, it's acceptance. This is just what them and their friends do. For people who rely on payday loans, it can be a debt spiral. For several years now, economists have raised red flags of a record high of decades. We hear stories every day about why people get into debt. We do our Joe Debtor study because we want to go beyond the anecdotes and figure out exactly what causes insolvency. So in order to help our clients, we gather a lot of information, who they owe money to, what they own, what their budget looks like, and we take all of that data, we crunch the numbers, and develop the profile of the average person who files insolvency. That's what we call Joe Debtor. So in 2018, what we found is that the millennials are now uh, our largest area of concern. Uh, last couple of years, we've been focusing on seniors and, and single parent moms. And they're still a very important segment of our, our survey. But the millennials are really causing us um, dramatic concerns because of the changes in their segment. So what we've seen is not only an increase in the numbers that are filing, but a, uh, a change in the, the makeup of their debt. The most common age we see for someone filing a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy is in their mid-40s, a, a Gen Xer. But it's millennials whose share of insolvency is rising the most. Since we first did this study in 2011, millennials' share of the workforce has gone up by 21%. They're a greater percentage of the workforce. But since that time, their share of insolvencies filed has gone up by 162%. The average person that, that we see owes about $50,000. The average millennial only owes about $36,000. So you'd think they would be more able to deal with their situation. But the, the truth is that they can't. Millennials are a generation buried in student loan debt. 31% of millennials that I meet with have student loan debt. Student loans that are guaranteed by the government are only eliminated in a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal if you've been out of school for over seven years. They, they, they graduate or some of them drop out. You still owe the money even if you've dropped out of the course. Uh, but once they've graduated, if they can't find employment, again, they're now starting to think, well, how do I take care of repaying all these debts? And they haven't been out of school now long enough for the debt to be forgiven or for them to be eligible for some of the programs through the government to have the debt reduced. So they've got a lot of student loan debt. Um, and they've sometimes had to supplement their student loans with using their credit cards or uh, lines of credit to finish the education if they couldn't get enough OSAP. So they're used to debt from day one almost. As soon as they leave the nest, it's like, it's like credit, right? So um, there's no period of living cash only or, or living by cash flow only. Like very few of them have experienced a five-year period where they just paid their bills on, on their income. 
I vaguely recall tuition being around $3,000. I vaguely recall paying rent, sharing an apartment with somebody where I believe we paid $300 each for a two bedroom apartment. And beyond that, a few hundred dollars for books and then obviously the rest of the budget was beer. Um, but I, I can't imagine that you can go to school for that cheap now. Which then means they're using, they're using payday loans, they're using credit cards, using anything to just to get by on their day-to-day -day living expenses. Now anybody who's ever seen any of, of my interviews in the past knows that these payday loan people drive me absolutely nuts. And I'm going to tell you why. So a millennial's average income is about $2,500. These are the people that became insolvent, filed up something with our firm. Uh, they have an average of $4,800 worth of payday loan debt. So the idea behind a payday loan, the way the law is written, you're allowed to borrow up to 50% of your normal take-home pay. So you get paid every two weeks. If your income is um, $2,400 a month like a millennial, that means you should be able to borrow $600. Well, so the average millennial that we see owes $4,800 in payday loans. That's almost, well, it is. It's twice what their monthly income is. So obviously the laws aren't working properly, but more importantly, you can't service $4,800 worth of debt that you're supposed to repay in two weeks if you only make $1,200 every two weeks. It's just not possible. The idea behind a payday loan is you're borrowing a, a relatively small amount of money, but you're required to pay back the entire amount in a very short period of time. Um, the interest rates, so to speak, themselves are sort of within the law, but the fees that are charged in terms of carrying this debt are enormous in the context of how much money you're borrowing. So you might borrow $650. Um, and have to pay it back two weeks later and owe the payday company $800 to do it. If that was an isolated incident, that really shouldn't break anyone. But the thing is you needed that money before you got paid. And then when you get paid, you're using potentially the majority of your paycheck to pay back the loan, which for most people is gonna leave them broke again. And so then the cycle starts where you're moving on to potentially a second payday loan uh, or even moving into an installment loan through a payday lender which is a higher amount of money paid back over a longer period of time, but at an exorbitant interest rate that makes it almost impossible to effectively pay back. I saw somebody last week, week before last, with 15 payday loans. That's not the most I've seen, but she's recent and she had, so 12 of them were actual traditional payday loans and three of them were these new installment loans. And that's what they're doing now because when the government brought uh, the changes in uh, to, to try and restrict things with payday lending last summer, the payday lenders just said, okay, we'll just lend them more. So instead of actual payday loans, we'll give them installment loans, 5,000, 10, 15, and that's all the ads you see now. You don't see payday loans being advertised by payday lenders. It's always installment loans now. They have good marketing. They, they talk about the fact that they can help. They don't talk about the fact there's that there's, they don't talk about their high interest rate. They talk about these low payments. They don't talk about the fact that it's over five, six, seven years. They hook people on that low payment because people are stressed. And all they're thinking about is, okay, I need to make these credit card payments. Hey, company XYZ is giving me $5,000. No question asked. Well, I can use that. Pay my credit card at you know, 18%, not thinking about the fact that now just signed on to a loan at 34%. All they're looking at is monthly payment. I've noticed also a lot of uh, payday loan commercials that you see on TV are very specifically, I think, targeted towards the millennial generation. Uh, you see a lot of the actors that they use in their ads are very young people. Um, and um, I, was, I was saying to my wife the other day, we saw one of the commercials and it was almost like a Parenting 101 commercial where uh, the ad was all about we, you know, we have two products. We have a payday loan or we have a, you know, five or $10,000 credit line available. Which one will you choose? And it kind of reminded me about being a parent of a young child where, you know, if you want your kid to eat your vegetables, it's difficult sometimes to say to the kid, you've got to eat your vegetables. Whereas if you give them that choice of two bad options and say, well, you know, which one are you going to have today? Are you going to have the broccoli or the cauliflower? They're more inclined to decide, well, I will guess I'll have the broccoli today because I have to choose one of them. And it reminded me this payday loan commercial of that aspect that you're kind of gearing the ad. It's quite clever in a way that you're gearing the ad to say, these are not great options, but you know, here's one option, a payday loan, or here's a, a, a credit line that has a 35% interest rate.
Which one will you choose? And I think a lot of people think, well, I guess if I had to choose, I would choose that one because you're asking them to make that choice. And I think the ads are very specifically targeted to that age range for that reason. It's kind of disturbing because the millennials are, are also, on the other hand, are very debt and finance savvy, more than I was, or more than any of my buddies were. Like they know more about stuff to, to do with money and debt. Mostly, I think it's because of the, the Internet. I mean, they grew up with the Internet, right? So they're just used to finding stuff out and researching things. Um, but that doesn't always help them because they're also more susceptible to online lending and things like that. It's so easy, right? Like you know, payday loans, they can get a payday loan in five minutes online, right? So there's no barrier to like getting up out of your chair, getting in your car, driving somewhere, sitting with somebody face to face, right? It's just, it's impersonal and it's super easy, right? Credit is fundamentally you know, it's making up the difference. It's making up the gap between the money that's coming in and my different obligations on a monthly basis. If I don't have the money saved up, I'm using credit to maintain some kind of balance. And I mean, banks are, I mean, banks still lend money in lots of different ways, but they're more cautious about how they lend money compared to 10 or 15 years ago. And so, um, so if, if the millennial can't get a big line of credit, and there's limits on their credit cards. I mean, not that those are good things to be doing, but that's that's kind of a natural, instinctive thing that people will do to maintain that balance. But at some point, if they still have that imbalance between their inflows and their outflows, and they're tapped out on their credit, what's the next thing that you do? Well, you start to rely on these other lenders that will lend money to virtually anybody, but at very, very high interest. There's this perception that millennials don't use credit cards. They don't have access to credit cards. Well, it's, it's not true. For the last three years, the amount millennials owe on credit cards has been increasing. And that was after it declined for a few years prior to that. It's not big ticket items that they're using their credit cards for. We see it's very common that they're using credit cards for everyday living expenses. They're buying groceries. They're paying for clothes. That's where they get into trouble with the credit cards because they start using them to deal with, I have to make a payment, I have to do this, I have to get rent done, I have to buy food. Um, so that's the stopgap measure which gets them into the trouble that spirals out. They never had a credit card that you had to pay off each month. So for me, at 45 years old, I remember my first credit card was a $500 credit card that I got and you had to pay it off or it stopped working. If you didn't pay off each month, you never had access to it, it stopped working. Where the young generation, they have these big limits and all they ever have to pay is a minimum payment each month. So for them, it's a lot different in that side of it because it's so easy for them to carry it. So the thought process isn't about paying it off. So, so I'm gonna say 25 years ago, people were still kind of afraid of being in debt. Uh, I can tell you personally that in 1992, when I was in university, I had to struggle to get a $500 limit on a credit card. It was not easy um, to take on debt when I was younger. Uh, and that's changed. So now we see people who are in their early 20s who've got a couple of credit cards, uh, maybe a payday loan, maybe not a payday loan. They'll have cell phone contracts that have gotten out of hand and this will age me obviously, but 23 years ago, you couldn't get a cell phone contract. There really wasn't such a thing for most people. And so you certainly couldn't go over on your data and you certainly couldn't make uh, a, a, have a bill that you couldn't pay. Um, looking at a, a millennial's monthly budget, their rent, their groceries, their car payment, all those sort of things, they've got $2,400 a month to spend. That's their average income. And it leaves them with about $250 a month to, to pay towards their debts. Well, you can't make the minimum required payments on $36,000 worth of debt with $250. It's just not possible. So of all the millennials who file with us, 88% of them are working at the time they file. So it's not a problem that they don't have a job. The problem is they tend to be working at a series of part-time jobs, they're doing contract work, their income is sporadic, and so it's very hard when you have unstable income to be planning for the future, you end up using debt to survive, and that's what ends up causing some serious problems. The economy has been what it has been for the last several years. There's jobs out there, but not necessarily long-term long -term employment or jobs that are gonna pay a lot of money. So they're getting in there, they're making minimum wage or a couple bucks above that, but that's barely covering their costs. By the time they pay rent, their cell phone, their car insurance, their car payments, life expenses, they have very little leftover money. Yeah, it's several jobs, 
part-time, they're interns. It's not, they're not working in their field, that two or three years of experience under their belt. Um, the employers, it's kind of, you're kind of hunting for your work uh, all the time. Like no stability. So like, you know, the stability that was afforded my parents' generation, or even mine, um, is just not there. Like they don't think that way, right? And so they expect to be in debt. And just for example, I had one client who was um, wanted to work in graphic design and had a pretty extensive background in it educationally, at least to my eyes, um, and had one six-month contract for graphic design a few years ago, but, but had otherwise been working jobs that were um, in factories and that kind of thing, again, on contracts, willing to work and do almost anything, but having a really hard time finding a job that actually fit what he was trained for. Job market cost of living, the way um, the way housing prices have ballooned out of control over the last 15, 20 years. There's a lot of factors that I think have put millennials at, at risk of having long-term financial stability and I truly hope it comes back. Like nobody, you know, nobody should um, ideally be living with financial uncertainty, but there's always these risk factors that, that, can, um, that can cause that, unfortunately. The price of housing is substantially higher than it was several years ago. Um, so one of the challenges that a younger person is facing is how do you even get to a point where you can put a down payment together to buy the home, um, let alone how are you going to pay for it once you get into it. With, with an average take-home pay of about $2,400 a month, millennials don't have enough income to meet all of their living expenses and their debt payments. And it's particularly a, a problem in big cities where the cost of living has gone up, rent is very high, it's very difficult to survive. And unlike Gen Xers or baby boomers who perhaps owned a house that's gone up in value and they can refinance the house to cover their debts, millennials don't have assets. So they're doubly bound by lower income and not having the assets. And as a result, we are seeing more and more millennials resorting to a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy. They simply don't have any room to maneuver. They're out of options. Now, one of the reasons that the demographics are changing slightly is that the Generation Xers, the baby boomers that have houses, have been accessing the equity in their houses to repay their debt. So the average Canadian household has more debt now than they've ever had in the past. But the folks with houses, which is uh, easily a third, 40% of the population, have been tapping into that equity to carry them through this crisis. The problem that we're seeing now, and this has got nothing to do with millennials, is that interest rates have started to rise. And so I easily predict that in the next year, the number of clients that we see with houses is gonna go up dramatically. Well, that's exactly it. You're more likely to have a senior or Gen X with a house than you're with a millennial because they haven't had the, the time to get that income, save that down payment, get that history, get that job to be able to afford the, the, bigger, the bigger debt stuff like cars, boats, homes. If they're maybe a Gen Xer, maybe their timing is right where they could get into a home before the prices ballooned out of control and they benefited from that growth in the value where now they have significant equity in their home. Where if they have a bit of uh, like a debt problem, because their timing is right, they've got equity built up, just because the values went up, it's not like they did anything special. They can go to the bank and they can tap into some of that equity to consolidate their debts. Whereas if you miss that time, if you're just a little bit younger, right? If you're just a little bit younger and you're, you're a millennial compared to a Gen Xer, you didn't hit the timing right, so you didn't have the money to get into a house, and now you have a debt problem, you try to talk to your bank about refinancing, but you don't have the property where the bank sees that it's a reasonable risk to lend you that money. So if you don't have that property, and you're not going to get a consolidation under reasonable interest rate. So it's like there's these different factors that um, I, I feel like the, the millennials are, they're in a bit of a tough spot. The challenge for millennials to get into the home market is, of course, the, the price of housing has gotten ridiculous. Uh, there are no starter homes for people anymore. And it's impossible to save that down payment if you're trying to service all these debts. So again, the millennial gets out of school, They've got $15,000 worth of student loan debt, so already they're behind the eight ball. That's got to be dealt with before they can start saving. Then they're setting up their new home, so there are all sorts of purchases you've got to make. Furniture, pots and pans, you know, all that sort of stuff costs money. And so you've got this $36,000 worth of debt and no ability to pay it down. So buying a house, it's just not possible for most of them. 
What I think I'm hearing from a lot of people who are younger is that they feel like that they're in a trap of debt um, and a cycle of, of precarious employment that they don't see a way out of. So they're carrying student loans, um, which can be quite hefty. Um, they are carrying credit card debt, things like payday loans or installment loans. Um, their pay is barely covering their living expenses and they're not seeing the, the sort of expectation of uh, income increasing uh, over time that, that people uh, in generations before them might have been able to see.